So um, hello everybody, um, my name is Emma Hallam and I'm a consultant therapeutic radiographer and I am based at the um, Nottingham Radiotherapy Centre. I um, developed and lead a late effects service which is actually for all um, cancer tumour types um, but I have a particular interest in head and neck late effects and I actually do run a late effects clinic where I actually do a bit of rehab as well for the head and neck cancer patients and that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. If I can get my screen to move on, there we go. Okay, so we all know that head and neck cancer treatments, there's many treatments that patients can have. This can include surgery, chemotherapy, biological therapy, such as immunotherapy and radiotherapy. But what we actually know is that patients who have multimodality treatments, so a number of these treatments, and that often is the case, they will often have a higher symptom burden and potentially an increase of late effects. And where my expertise really lies is in the chemotherapy and radiotherapy um, side of things. So we know that living a life with a history of cancer is unique for every person. Some patients will have very minimal problems whatsoever, if, if, if any, but others will have major that can be really difficult to live with. For most, life, I say, is different after cancer, but many will have these ongoing physical and emotional challenges that will experience daily. And some work that Macmillan did back in 2013 found that cancer and its treatment often leaves a grueling physical and mental legacy for many years afterwards. So what is a late effect? Well, a late effect is a side effect that either doesn't settle or a symptom that develops six months or many years after completing treatment. And sometimes they can be difficult to diagnose. However, I would say that for head and neck, I think it is easier to diagnose, but certainly for pelvic late effects, it really can be the case. We also know that those treatment side effects, especially those from radiotherapy can, be, can not only be difficult to diagnose, but management can be complex and that sometimes more damage can be done to the irradiated tissues by inappropriate investigations and treatment. So what about the scale of the problem then? Well, there's currently three million people living with cancer in the UK, and this is gonna to rise to over 3.5 million by 2025, and to over 4 million by 2030. So you can see that, you know, we're, we're, the survival rates are incurring, so there's so many more people living with and beyond cancer, but this will mean so many more patients are also living with these treatment related consequences. And we know that one in four cancer survivors will have one or more treatment related consequences affecting their quality of life. Just to um, go down a bit deeper now into head and neck late effects really. And I, I really don't like giving statistics because actually it really depends whether you've got that late effect or not. Because if you're a person or a patient with that late effect, then that statistic is really significant to you. But if it isn't, then it probably isn't. But a study that was done back in 2019 of 162 patients found that 78% of those patients had at least one late effect from their treatment. 44% had a dry mouth, 28% reported skin changes, 22 skin fibrosis and 14 dental decay. So Bristol Myers Scribbs did some work in 2019 about the experience of patients living with and beyond head and neck cancers. The symptoms again reported, no surprise, dry mouth, trouble in swallowing, jaw stiffness, changes in voice and speech, pain or numbness and loss of taste. But in terms of what they felt their quality of life was really affected by, this was eating issues, problems with communication, trouble sleeping and maintaining libido. Back in 2013, Macmillan did some work called throwing, throwing the Light on the Consequence of Cancer Treatment, and they found that 78% of patients had experienced a physical health problem in the last 12 months that was related to their treatment. And I just found this statistic staggering and really why I wanted to push forward with the late effects service, that 71% of those patients who finished treatment 10 years ago or more had experienced a physical health problem in the last 12 months that was directly related to their cancer treatment. It found that 40% were living with emotional problems and hadn't sought any help. And 40% said they were unaware of any long-term side effects. Now, I think we're much better now at consenting patients and talking about the late effects of treatment. But I think also we find that patients often will take anything when they're diagnosed because they really want to just survive their cancer. So we do have to be aware of this. Although the Royal College of Radiologists have just um, released some new consent forms, which really do delve down more into the late effects. So it's really pleasing to see that. So radio, I'm going to concentrate first of all about the radiotherapy and then touch on the chemotherapy side of it, because it's really the radiotherapy that tends to cause the most late effects for the head and neck cancer patients. And this is all because radiotherapy really is a treatment that keeps on giving. It's so good at getting rid of the cancer cells, but it causes something called radiation-induced fibrosis or RIF, as we also know it. 
So this is a progressive fibrotic sclerosis with varying clinical symptoms. And all the tissues that are in the treatment field can be affected. This includes the skin, any connective tissue, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. And it can really affect that normal body functioning by causing hardening, tightening, and restriction of tissues and muscles. It can be lifelong and it can be progressive. So these are the late effects that we commonly see. And these are what I commonly see in our, in our late effects service. And the pictures there that you can see there, the one where, um, the first one that you can see there, um, you can see this is the fibrosis that you can see, this fibrotic changes to the skin where it gets puckered up. And we often call it like a woody neck, but you often find with this that patients come to me and they might be five, seven years out of treatment and they come and they've got this woody neck and they can't move their necks anymore. And on the other side there, you can see that's a bit more of um, skin changes that we can see called radiation dermatitis. It's just to change that stage, just the breaking of the, of the blood vessels there, um, along with some fibrosis. And you can see how shiny the skin is there. So it's quite taut for the patient. So this uh, fibrosis is what really causes all of these things, like I said earlier. Um, and like I said, we do see these skin changes. We also see lymphedema, and I'm going to come on to that on a separate slide shortly. And we find with lymphedema and fibrosis and the skin changes, ultimately there's also usually pain associated as well due to the tightness and the restriction. If you think about where we are, where we've treated and you've got this fibrosis, you'll often find that patients will have varying swallowing difficulties as well. This might be because of where the actual cancer has been either removed by surgery and affected the swallowing apparatus, or it could be that the actual where the tumour has melted away. We often find that it can leave a bit of a crevice Again, it can also be due to the tightness and tightening and restriction from the radiation fibrosis. It might also be because of the dry mouth. We know that dry mouth is one of the most commonly reported things um, that patients experience. And if you haven't got enough saliva to help break your food down or make that bolus, as we call it, when you chew your food down and then move it to the back to swallow it, you're not going to get weight loss as well. Um, so it's a whole combination of things, really, that kind of cluster together. So patients very rarely will, will come to my service with just one um, late effect. Dry mouth often will also lead to a bad breath because patients will often be not be maintaining that saliva. Um, they may have dental problems, again, due to the, often due to the, um, the, the dry mouth. They haven't got the ends, natural enzymes in saliva that um, manage to clean our teeth and keep debris off there um, that throughout the day. So it's really important that we're, we're looking at um, oral care and how we're looking after our mouths. Lack of taste is something that patients, um, it usually goes hand in hand with a dry mouth, but I have some patients who've got perfectly well-functioning salivary glands and their dry mouth is fine, but they have just either got no taste or horrible taste, or they may be able to taste just salty or just sweet. And what we tend to find with um, both dry mouth actually and um, the, the, the salivary, um, sorry, the um, um, dry mouth and the take, lack of taste is that once you get to two years out of treatment, that tends to be how you stay. But within that time, I've seen patients go for a whole year with a very dry mouth and no taste, and then suddenly they, their taste buds um, kick back in. Um, patients can report stiffness of the jaws. So this is where we have affected the joint here, temporal mandibular joint, and we cause stiffening within that. Initially, it can be because of inflammation from the radiotherapy that's caused itself, but over time, it's due to this radiation-induced fibrosis that tends to, to lock in, and over time, the jaw just can't open as much. So then again, patients can have difficulty in eating, drinking, um, might get um, um, bad breath because they can't clean their teeth, and then they get more tooth decay. It's this vicious circle. We also know that patients can experience um, neck and shoulder function. A lot of this, again, will be usually be due to the surgery in the first instance, but then it can be due to the fibrosis affecting how patients can move their neck and maybe raise their shoulder. I do see a lot of patients who get these neck spasms, and this is off. This is again, again due to the radiation fibrosis affecting the muscles in that area, but also the nerve endings as well and the nerves that are in there. Um, and, you know, some patients have reported that they actually have to, they feel that they can actually see their neck going to spasm. And these can be really quite painful for patients. Um, I had one patient who said that his family thought he was having a stroke or a fit every time he had these um, um, episodes. And again, some patients may just get one and then one never again. Other patients might have four, five, ten a day. Hearing loss, tinnitus and balance issues. This can be caused by the radiotherapy, but 
inevitably usually it's to do with more the chemotherapy side effects and when you have your radiotherapy you, you have your chemotherapy alongside of it so it's kind of a a double whammy really um but hearing loss and particularly this tinnitus this ringing in the ears um can be really quite problematic for some patients um, and if your hearing is affected then you can tend to find that your balance can be affected as well peripheral neuropathy is where we've affected the um the nerve endings really, um, but we can tend to find that, and that happens much more with the chemotherapy um, side of things, but you can tend to find that even patients who've just had radiotherapy tend to get this numbness and tingling in their, in their hands in particular, um, and that's something that um, patients um, we need to manage with. Burning tongue syndrome is, is a bit of a phenomenon really, or sometimes people call it burning mouth syndrome. Again, I feel it's very much down to the peripheral neuropathy, so the damage that's done to the nerve endings within the tongue there. But this really can be problematic to patients because they, they literally say that their mouth is on fire um, and that very little relieves it. So they can't wear their dentures or they can't speak. Again, they might not be able to eat. We know that dry mouth makes this worse. We know that certain medications that we put patients on for burning mouth, uh, burning tongue syndrome, they often make, make more of a dry mouth. So it really can be sometimes a balancing act of working with a patient at what helps you and what isn't and what's more prevalent at that time. Thyroid problems, um, underactive thyroid, um, if your thyroid gland has been in the radiotherapy field and all patients should be having their thyroid glands checked on an annual basis with their GP. Because um, this is easily rectified if you do find this, you, see, you get put on some medication for this. And if, if I have a patient who comes to me, if they're really fatigued all the time, and certainly have a sensitivity to cold, um, I will always make sure we get their thyroid gland checked. OK, so these are the less common late effects that we see. Um, and these are the things that if you was to look in the in the research, they would be saying that it's like, like one up to five percent probably of patients that would have this. The first one is actual direct nerve damage. Um, but again, the radiotherapy is so carefully planned these days. It's very rare that we find anybody who's been treated, I'd say, within the last 10 years that does have direct nerve damage from the radiotherapy. Necrotic radiation ulcers, and this is where um, the skin breaks down within the treatment area and just doesn't heal or breaks down a few years afterwards, and we just cannot get these ulcers, ulcers healed. Osteoradial necrosis of the jaw is where um, we damage the blood supply to, to, to the jawbone, and then the jaw becomes um, exposed and necrotic. And this is why we get your dental, your teeth looked at before you have radiotherapy and advise you to have any dental work done before that. Because if you have got an osteoradial necrosis of the bone and then you go and have a dental extraction, the chances are that that socket may not heal. Sadly, osteoradial necrosis is a really under-researched area. There is some fantastic um, research out there, um, and um, but it's not graded well. There is no gold standard of care. Um, and if you have osteoradial necrosis, it can be really problematic. It can be really painful. It can lead to further surgery. Carotid artery patency is where the radiotherapy affects the carotid artery um, and patients can um, experience a number of symptoms from this, such as lightheadedness, dizziness, um, so um, tingling again in the hands. Um, so it's something else that we might get a Doppler um, looking at to see about that. Cervical dystonia is actually, uh, it's, it's still one of the less common effects, although we've seen it quite a number of times in our clinic. And this is this head drop, and these are the pictures that I've got there for you. And it's literally where patients are unable to hold their own head up um, because we've affected the muscles there. Um, so often we have to get a special collar made and try and work on some exercises, but it can be really difficult for patients um, when they're, you know, they're falling all over the place because they literally can't hold their own heads up. The current oral thrush, um, lots of patients will get this when they're on their treatment, but some patients just cannot get rid of this. And because of the dry mouth and because they're not eating, and often as well, this is often linked to the burning mouth syndrome or burning tongue syndrome, it can be really problematic. So often we really case, it's not a case of just keep giving a patient different antifungal treatments we need to be making sure that we're taking swabs for this and making sure that we're making that what we're giving the patient is sensitive to that and I have had a couple of patients that I've actually had to admit for IV antibiotics to really get on top of this it's also connected to feeding tubes so if you have a feeding tube the chances are it's just tracting backwards and forwards and um, so often trying to get on top of the nutrition and feeding and getting rid of the tube if we can is the only way to actually get rid of that oral thrush 
And there's always the risk of secondary cancers. I've never seen anybody who's had a secondary cancer from head and neck cancer treatment from radiotherapy, but it is something that we always um, consent patients to because it is radiation that we have been dealing with. So just to move on to lymphedema a little bit more now. Um, so we know that 75 to 90% of patients could suffer with external or internal lymphedema or a combination of both. And from my experience, lymphedema has always been present before radiation induced fibrosis is detected. And this is why I'm so keen on treating lymphedema as soon as we, as soon as we identify it. Because we know that the early stages of lymphedema are reversible. But yeah, if it's left untreated and patients are referred to me five, six years down the line, then we tend to find those the patients who have these real fibrotic changes in the tissue, this radiation fibrosis, and they're the ones that are resistant to therapies. We know that treating early and educating patients could really prevent late stage lymphedema, reduce associated burdens of so side effects and improve quality of life. So what are the symptoms then of head and neck lymphedema and radiation induced fibrosis? They kind of go a bit hand in hand, really, although many times you'll only have one of them. The first one is that you can get swelling within the area and this can be localised or much more widespread. So you may have just had your, your neck area treated, but if them lymphatic drainage channels are blocked, I've seen patients where they're, you know, they, they can hardly see out their eyes because the, the lymphedema the, is so bad on the face because that's where the fluid is collected because it cannot drain down those normal channels. It can be a tightness, pain and discomfort. And again, you can get reduced movement of head, neck and shoulders, which can often lead to poor posture. It means patients can't work, you know, can't, can't walk very well as well, which then leads to, leads to increased swelling because patients become much more sedentary. It can also produce more swallowing difficulties and speech difficulties. It can also affect your breathing and give much more, patients will often talk much more about nasal congestion or that their nose is always running or they feel like they're always congested. It can cause middle ear pain and congestion. It can also affect our eyesight, like I said, if the puffiness is so much there, and it can have this real altered body image. And often patients become really frustrated, embarrassed and anxious about um, um, lymphedema and in particular radiation and fibrosis. The first thing I just want to say there, though, is if anybody does recognise any of these and they think they may have a collection of fluid, it may only be minimal under the chin there. That's quite a common place for it to collect. If you can, I would really advise you to speak to your lymphedema team. So we know that I've just mentioned that hand in hand lymphedema and the fibrosis often comes and these late effects come in line with these um, with managing dysphagia, which is difficulty in swallowing. So how do we compensate for that? How do we do that? Well, often it is about trying to change our posture and the way we are. And again, I, I'd reiterate here, if you can speak to a speech and language therapist or speech and swallow therapist, it's really important to do this. But I also know that some patients, many years out of treatment, do not have access to these services. So I just wanted to really try and give some tips and tricks, really. Um, but trying to make sure that you're holding your head up, changing the way your head is to, to, to do that swallow can sometimes help making sure that our muscles here in our neck and our shoulders are quite strong um, can really help with our swallowing. And this is something that people don't always put two and two together. Trying to, you might have to modify your diet and the fluids. So it might be um, that you um, have to um, thicken your fluid so that you're not coughing on your fluids. Um, so it's not going down the wrong hole. It might be that you have to drop to a soft and bite size or mince and moist diet. The triangles there are what we use on our, it's called, it's called eat through radiotherapy. And it's our key that we move patients up and sometimes back down again. So it's about being aware of them levels of, of food and fluids that you can manage. Good mouth care is essential um, because if you are at risk of something food or flu is going down the wrong hole and you've got bacteria in your mouth that's when you're more likely to get a chest infection or aspirate and get a chest infection that's when you're coughing and that on the fluids or food so it's really important that we are following good mouth care advice and again safe swallowing techniques if you've got access to these with all of this with radiation induced fibrosis and lymphedema movement is key and that's quite apt and tits as we're on the Move Charity um, <laughs> webinar tonight. Um, but really is it's about doing some neck exercises to keep all that area functioning, but also making sure that we're keeping our facial um, area moving as well. So making sure that we're opening that mouth like we can do. So there's lots of things on the internet there. And at the end, I've got a few sites that are particularly helpful. Um, but if you have been given some exercises to do by either a swallow therapist, a physiotherapist, 
I would really recommend that you may be needing to do them for life because we know that this radiation fibrosis can build but many years after treatment. So the more active we can be, certainly with these finer movements, then can we break down this fibrosis? And that's something that I'm trying to um, look into and research too with, that, with, in, with our patients in Nottingham. So this is just to show the late effects of chemotherapy. So we know that chemotherapy is a whole body treatment and it can affect anywhere within the body. However, if I'm honest, with the, the chemotherapy agents that we use head and neck, it really tends to be the, the, nip, the peripheral neuropathy, and I put my teeth back in, and the tinnitus in the ring and in the ears. I've not seen any patient yet who's been a head and neck patient who has come with any gastrointestinal problems, or any problems with their bowels. But I just thought I would put this on here um, so you're aware of the things that, you know, the chemotherapy can affect. OK, so this now we're going to talk about is the late effects of all cancer treatments. And no surprise that every patient that comes to our clinic usually flags for fatigue as well. And we know it's the most commonly reported symptom at over 10 years out of treatment. And that for head and neck patients, can, it's not just the fact of what they've been through, but it's because of how life changes afterwards and everything that they may have to possibly deal with. We know that pain is really common. We also know that pain is sometimes is to do with the, the, like the, the psychology of pain and, and the way the body remembers that last time you had pain like this, you had to be really concerned about it. So often we have to work on turning our pain receptors down and telling our pain receptors that actually this is OK, this is safe now. Um, but we have to be so aware of, of, of how things change for head and neck patients. We have, I have many patients who sadly their relationships break down afterwards because they never get back to sleep in, in, the, in the bedroom with their partner or they don't eat again with their families. So it's this the psychological and psychosocial side of head and neck cancer treatment is something and how this affects patients for many years after is something that should be really taken seriously by all um, health professionals. We know patients can get a reduced cognitive function, and this again is often due to fatigue, but is it due to lack of nutrition? Sometimes it can be due to the chemotherapy that's been used as well. We see body image concerns and changes in sexual function. And it's not just about not being able to get an erection, it's about not being able to kiss because uh, one of the partner's drows, mouth might be so dry or they're so worried that their breath smells so much. So some things that at one time just felt the actual norm become so alien and so hard to do they may not be able to get a seal on the lips to actually if they've, they've had um, such surgery to be able to do um, a kiss anyway so you know it's all these things that, that come together so these psychological challenges really can be really problematic and we also see a lot of patients I've had a, a real number of patients who we've got this what we call survivor's guilt and this is where patients feel they should be lucky to be alive oh, the consultant told me that I'd, I'd get a dry mouth or the consultant told me that I'd have problems with my swallowing. So I should be lucky to be alive, but actually I don't feel it. We also have a number of patients who feel that they just can't talk to their families anymore. Or not that they can't talk to their families, they're fed up of telling their family and friends how they are. So they kind of just say that they're OK when actually inside they don't feel it. So this really then can build up to much more of a psychological issue. And we always know then that anything psychologically affects our physical symptoms more. Fear of recurrence is always there at the back of anybody's mind. And just really trying to adjust to this new life, as some people will call it. And we have patients who have to give up their studies. We've had lots of patients who've had to give up their jobs because of the change. They just can't manage what they are and um, what they used to do. So what can we do then? So obviously, if you've got access to a late effects service and uh, they see head and neck patients, then that's absolutely fantastic. But I know many patients don't have access to this, although we are working on it and many services are setting up and down uh, up and down the country. Um, but what I would say living with head and neck late effects is the first thing is if you notice any changes, do report it. So that's in terms of swelling, certainly coughing on fluids and solids any new pain and any significant weight loss that's unexplained. These are really important because we know it doesn't always mean there's a cancer's come back. And I know that can be very frightening for a lot of people. And sometimes we don't quite want to admit that because we're scared to get that as an answer. But often if we can identify an early, early late effect, particularly the fibrosis and the lymphedema, I truly believe we can start to reduce that burden that may happen later on if we ignore it. 
please follow any given exercises that you were given any plans and really try that you try to stick to them on a daily basis they say three times a day they've been given for a reason to try and stop that lymphedema building back up adopting a good oral hygiene and dental care is essential you know so make sure that you're seeing your dentist we recommend every three months but i also know it's so difficult for so many patients to um, get access to dental treatment if they're not under an NHS dentist at the moment but I can't advocate that if you can that this is a this is a must if you've got access to a hygienist I know some centres uh, ready paper centres will certainly keep their patients under under the hygienist for a few years after treatment if you've been given fluoride trays to use then use these and try and use a higher fluoride toothpaste where possible but really just trying to have that really good oral hygiene so making sure that you're cleaning your teeth twice a day that you're flossing as well I'd also advise that you use a mouthwash and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. We often find that things like Corsadol are far too set strong for patients and actually have more of a drying effect. All we really need to use is some uh, is a, a, a pint of water with half a teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. I'd also recommend that when you've had anything to eat or drink, even if that's a 40 sip, so one of these supplement drinks um, that sometimes patients are on for many years after treatment, is that you rinse with, with that mouthwash or some plain water to try and make sure that you haven't got any debris or sugary bits just sitting there on your teeth trying to damage that enamel. Try and manage your dry mouth where you can. Now, this is very difficult because if I, I don't, I'm not a lover of dry mouth products. I don't feel that they work. Um, I'd rather, much rather patients didn't pay out for things that don't work for them. If you can find a product that works for you, that's fantastic. Um, and the Swallows charity will actually send you out if you contact them and I've got them on, on another slide. They will send you a support box which has got dry mouth products in there. The problem with dry mouth products is that many GPs will not prescribe them. They're not on, um, on the formularies. Um, so you will have to source them yourself. And the amount of patients that I see that they'll be using a certain gel or a certain spray and I go to the help and they go no I say well why are you using it well my consultant told me I should do so find something that works for you in from my experience and what, what I discuss with patients is my top tips are to make sure that you always keep um, some, some Vaseline or a lip balm on your lips rather than having a drink of water when your mouth is dry try and get a little spray bottle with water in it and spray just one spray so that you are adding to your saliva because when you have a drink of water you just wash any saliva that's there away the other thing to try is some olive oil or coconut oil just taking half a teaspoon of this and certainly with the coconut oil letting it melt around your mouth or with the olive oil just swishing it around your mouth and spitting it out can often put a bit of a um, like a, an oily film on there which can help and this can be particularly good at night time try as best as you can to maintain good nutrition and hydration so good fluids and really making sure that you're keeping those calories up and that it's good nutrition when you can be the patients that tend to do better with their late effects are those that are well nourished um skin care advice we know as we say that motion um sorry that that we need to um really moisturize the skin because the more hydrated the skin is the more supple it will be and again I, I the patients who have really good skin care and um, well moisturized are the patients that i'm not seeing back with the fibrosis or as much lymphedema so making sure that you're moisturizing with something that you know suits your skin and wearing a sunscreen um, and that's for life you know we we, we say for about a, a for year after radiotherapy treatment that you should keep um, a factor 50 so a total sunblock after that factor 25 30 is fine but your skin may always be prone to to burning more try and keep a good posture where you can we've certainly found during radio uh, sorry during covid times that patients have been coming back with much more lymphedema than we ever saw before and we can only put this down to the fact that people have become more sedentary. Uh, we're working from home more now, so we're more on laptops and um, hunched over um, and patients just haven't been getting out and about as much um, as they were. So we, we have been dealing with much higher rates and more significant lymphedema that's been harder to get rid of. If you can, you might want to um, change your sleeping position. And I don't mean necessarily sitting up in a chair because you might not get a good night's sleep, but maybe just putting one more pillar on there. Particularly if you've got lymphedema, we know that it collects overnight because it's got nowhere to drain to. But we also know that this can stop sometimes secretions getting quite thick overnight and collecting if, if they can drain a little bit more. Try and engage in physical activity and movement where possible. And sometimes mindfulness and relaxation can really help patients to get through. 
And what I would say is, is speak to your GP or your consultant about having some routine blood tests, particularly if you're feeling very fatigued. And um, they can check your thyroid gland, which isn't a routine test, but they, you know, they, they should pick up on that. But also to make sure that you're not lacking any any vitamins that can contribute to your tiredness. Um, but also this can pick up a um, peripheral neuropathy. Often we find that patients can be deficient in vitamin B um, if they've got this. So where can you find help then? Well, first of all, again, I must reiterate that report anything that doesn't feel right. Um, and I would try a local late effects service if you have got one. Now, we can only see patients that were either treated in Nottingham or, or Nottingham City uh, or County or within our area or come to one of our GPs. Um, but what I would say is contact your where you had your treatment, because there are many fantastic late effects services up now, uh, setting up now. Um, so, you know, you may be looking and even if, they, if they're not setting up right now, they may be in the future. So they, they'll be that way in. So do contact the tech team where you had your treatment. Also, what I would say is it's not just therapeutic radiographers. Some centres have fantastic rehab teams made up of physiotherapists and swallow therapists and dietitians. So, you know, I really would start there. I'd also try um, if you're lucky enough to have a local Maggie Centre because they do fantastic workshops on fatigue um, and they can really be a really good source of support. If you have no access to any of them and you're many years out of treatment, you might want to start with your GP and ask for a physio referral um, and a lymphedema referral. Um, they can refer direct to them, to them team. Sorry. So some helpful websites then, well, of course, Macmillan Cancer Support and Cancer Research UK um, do have information on there about um, late effects. But the charity that I really want to highlight today is um, Swallows. Um, so they're based over in Blackpool and they are a fantastic support service anywhere. In, the, in fact, not just UK, they are worldwide. Uh, they have uh, monthly meetings. They also have carers support and they will also do the support boxes. So. Um, Chris and Sharon Curtis, who run that um, support group, really are amazing. Um, and I love working with them, as you can tell from the way I gush over them. Um, there's also Mouth Care for Cancer Patients, um, which is another charity. And there's loads of other ones, such as Young Tongs, and there's, there's loads on there. And they're all going to start coming under one umbrella. Cancer Rehab PT is actually a website of a um, physiotherapist and I can't remember if it's New Zealand or Australia, I always get them mixed up um, and she's on Instagram and I do follow her because she has some really good exercises on there for fibrosis and lymphedema and for keeping, she, she's got things that say exercises for after you've had head and neck treatment and she does a lot of work around breast cancer as well but I really like what she does um, and I've watched all of her stuff and I feel it's very safe and so is our lymphedema specialist as well. Um, the lymphedema support network is really good for help and advice with lymphedema particularly if you can't get hold of a lymphedema specialist and then Joe Devine is a, is a website um, that was set up um, by a, a nurse who um, now she just does this full time and she um, um, it's kind of a, a sexual health um, site if you do go on there you will see lots of vibrators and lots of lubrication and that kind of thing which has also got blogs on there and really informative um like podcasts and things that patients can find whether it be about about sexual difficulties or living how getting your sex life back after cancer so it really is a a good place if you find you haven't got access to a, a psychosexual or sexual dysfunction clinic trek stock is a um another great um charity that supports patients who are treating their 20s and 30s Again, they're very much based around movement and, and getting people moving, but they also do great work, um, a great body system, and also do a lot of work around menopausal symptoms for the ladies. And finally, of course, I have to uh, mention Move Against Cancer, um, which again encourages us all, and they've got lots of information on their website if you're wanting to do a range of activities um, at varying levels. So just to end then, really, we just need to be mindful that, you know, Everybody who goes through this, these cancer treatments and will come out the other side and experience these late effects differently. So none of this is meant to frighten anybody, because even if you get one of them late effects, you might be absolutely fine with it. But also what we really need to think about is we need to think about how it's affecting you. And whenever you're explaining this, how you're feeling or what you're experiencing to any health, any health professional, you really need to get across it's how it's bothering you. It's about your, what we call subjective bother, and it's about what matters to you. So 
it might just be a dry mouth to, to, to a health professional, but to you, it might be the difference between you being able to carry on with your job and get a good night's sleep. So really try and push the point um, is what I'd say, because we all go through the same stuff, but differently. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.